before that start my talk, uh, I just realized now that uh, the EFT has, I mean, how they have came uh, over here for the last 30 years. And I'm using uh, this Paragraph software for the last 10 years. Uh, I remember uh, when I first went over there for a training, mm -hmm. uh, it was there in 2008, 2009, 2010. And it's been 2019, 10 years, it's a long time. Uh, we started with that, uh, that version where we don't know how to even, uh, I mean, now it's become like a, uh, too sophisticated. Uh, at those times, we have to calculate everything before to specify the mass rate and all those things. Uh, it becomes uh, much easier now to uh, tackle all those things. But it has, it has grown a lot. And I would say that in the last 10 years, uh, this tool has helped, especially in technique side, a lot in technology development. Because one of the chapter for Stone and Dutch, uh, which is formerly, I mean, now it's a formerly of Stone and Dutch, not such a thing, is to how we, what we can bring in the market. The main thing for us is that we don't want to be saying that, okay, we have the field in vectors, which is like 20 years old. We have a strength at distributor, which is, which is like, I mean, which is already there with uh, the, like, other technology licenses. So we like to bring the innovation, innovative ideas in front as soon as possible. And this tool, um, along with the others also, it helped us to bring the technology much faster in the industry. And uh, to begin with, basically I'm going to show, uh, I mean I'm going to use a uh, few examples to how we use this tool to, uh, to bring uh, the technology faster in the, in the market, uh, to develop the existing technology further, and to troubleshoot the, uh, the real scenarios in the HSC uh, units. And to begin with, um, I will be in, in a technology development area, I will, be, uh, I will touch base on uh, the core flow testing, the competition modeling, the role of competition modeling, or how it complements the core flow testing, um, how we use this tool to screen new ideas, and for the design changes, how we use this tool. I uh, will give some examples based on super packing, merging this figure up, value termination device, realization of the iterator. Some case studies also I will share. Um, one is on the uh, troubleshooting the jet predicator operation. Some government studies on a spent time distributor and the motion distributor, and finally, we'll include that. <laughs> to begin with the uh, SSC technology development, uh, as such, SSC is a very mature technology. We, I mean, it's, if, you, uh, if you look into the history of this one, it's been 50 to 60 years old, a lot of course for testing has been done in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. So there's a lot of work has been done. Uh, especially, I want to thank PSRI for helping us to be here. There's a lot of work being done to develop the, uh, the, the different features of the SEC. Whether it is, whether the flow goes in the riser, or all the gas and solids are separating in the RTD, or in the cyclones. What the flow, flow patterns look like in the in a public way, like in the region, and what color the flows looks like in a patrol way or a down flow mode. So there's a lot of work being done. And the beauty of the core flow test is that you get a very, very precise, very good insight of the basic fundamentals of what's going on in the system. You can visually see those things, but there are many things also. You cannot test everything. If you can test, but it's not economically feasible to test all these levels. You cannot have uh, to study all the parameters in your portfolio test. It's going to be very time consuming and it's going to be uh, not expensive also. And other thing is that portfolio test will do it on a limited scale. You cannot have an industrial scale test. You can replicate this level, but you cannot have an uh, industrial scale test done. And what CFD brings? What CFD brings is that it complements the core flow testing. You can screen your ideas. You can do parametric studies. You can look at different different angles of the problem and see what is crucial. You can come to you can screen those ones and then say, okay, now is the time to do the final testing. I mean, over here I'm showing how the gas uh, gas access flow patterns is in the uh, spent care distributor. How the flow in the either looks like. You can have a chemistry involved in that. How the flow in the heat looks like. 
this shows the gas flow, uh, gas and gas is mixing in the regenerator. This shows how the gas is coming from the standpoint, how well it is mixing in the regenerator. You can look at the temperature profile, you can look at the oxygen concentration, you can look at the single fluid concentration. There are a lot you can do, which is somewhat limited in the bowel fluid testing. You can look at how the cyclones will behave, whether the artery is separating the gas or not. All the flow is going to be uh, through the packing, so you can spread it a lot. <coughs> In nutshell, I can say that um, the competition modeling is a key aspect for the, uh, in the development of our SSC technology. Um, we are using it as a tool, we are using it as a uh, to screen ideas so that we can take the technology much faster in the industry. It saves us a lot of time. Sometimes we can uh, avoid doing the core flow testing. Uh, but I, I won't say that uh, it, we can avoid, but it helps us reduce the experimental count and help us bring the technology much faster. And of course, we need to know the uh, limitations of the CMP also. You have to be very careful what the medical models you are using. Be very careful how well you are defining your problem, whether the boundary condition, your assumption, your taking it correctly or not. Because it is, I mean, it, no software is the uh, is the ultimate thing. It's like a garbage in garbage out. So you have to be very careful. What's what's the what are all the limitations this software has, and how well you can use it. Generally, how we use it, we use the we use the this tool as a uh, as a for a comparison basis. We generally have a base case, we validate that base case, and based on that, we will study other cases and see oh, what's the delta change. Because, as you see, uh, you can recall that there are a lot of uh, questions on oh, whether this product is good or not, or whether this test model can capture my scenario or not. But we use this for this tool as this is what we have achieved so far. So, based on this, how well we can use it, and that's how we use it is to basically bring a data change in the performance with respect to changing the operating parameters or the hardware features. Um, few examples I can like give on the, um, the how we use this as a screening tool. Uh, I will start with the, the stripper packing. Um, as I was mentioning that um, our, uh, our goal is to bring the new technologies in the industry as soon as possible. So we have, we always say okay, there is a room in the room, a room of improvement in all the technologies, all the features. So how we can bring these from in front. So for the studio packing, um, this is the packing that looks like. It's a two-directional flow downward. Um, there are a lot of uh, ideas we have. Uh, like okay, if we arrange the blades in such a way that it has uh, four directions within the same layer, is it very useful? Should we have cuts in the blades? This is a four-directional uh, packing element. This is a four-directional packing element with the cuts in. And there are a lot of other ideas also. But we cannot test all those ideas in a core flow. It would be too expensive to do that. Today's going to charge me millions of dollars for that. So I have to screen those one. Yeah. <laughs> so this tool helps us to screen those ideas. If we have 10 ideas, we can shortlist. We can screen to two good ones, two best ones, and then say, then, what about now? Can I get a cut or not? <laughs> Another example of a uh, design optimization. So, uh, again, I'm showing a mushroom distributor, which we generally use both in a reactor application and in a regenerator application. In a reactor application, we uh, use in a DCC reactor where it is submerged in the bed. So the riser vapors are basically, uh, it goes to the bed also, uh, which are used to basically convert the gasoline product <coughs> to propylene. So we use in a DCC reactor so to have a good distribution of both catalyst and riser vapors into the bed. Uh, so over here I'm showing uh, just the effect of size of a distributor on the performance. So this is a smaller uh, mushroom uh, mushroom distributor. So we enlarge it to see whether how it 
whether it can improve the uh, distribution in the in the bed or not. And I'm showing over here a picture, a qualitative picture, which shows that all that the uh, the the um, the catalyst in the riser it comes out, it flows around the mush uh, around the mushroom, and it goes get mixed in the bed. And if I do uh, take a bigger mushroom, it does the same thing, but it occupies more more area. It improves the coverage. But if I look at the quantitative uh, data over here, I'm the uh, the gas flow uniformity that increases, which means that it is spreading more now in the bed. My uh, standard deviation in the gas velocity decreases, which correlates to bypassing. So degree of bypassing is reducing. Now it can spend more time in the bed rather than bypassing and not getting cracked. Vapor is not getting cracked in the bed. So that performance improved. If I look at the fractional bed cracking, it has improved with the enlarged mushroom compared to the standard one. So there is, I mean, it shows that, okay, it uh, improved by certain degrees, certain percentage. We cannot, I, I don't generally trust in a uh, absolute numbers, but the delta change, that's the key. It improved by almost like two, uh, uh, by twice, by two times, which is a, which is a good factor. Which means, okay, which means that I can either reduce my inventory because if, I, if my propylene yield is what I'm going to get is constant. So this means that I can use the lower inventory in the same, in the same bed to achieve the, uh, prop, the same propylene yield. Or if I can achieve more, this is a better way to do, go for it. So this gives us a directional view of what we should be doing, what changes we should be bringing in, in the design. Another example I'm showing over here for the uh, air distributor location on bed hydrodynamics. Uh, in this scenario, in this uh, regenerator, there are three uh, ring distributors at three different elevations. If I move the inner ring to a bottom tangent line, same as the uh, outer ring, it changes the whole hydrodynamics. My uniform, gas uniformity in the bed, bed uh, improves for this scenario. There's always, uh, there's always a saying that if you have a, uh, two FCC units designed at the same, uh, we have the same design principle, same design capacity, all, if it is a, exactly the same ditto copy of the, uh, uh, to each other, they might operate differently. They might have a different, uh, different problems. Might, one might be having a lot more issues than the other one. So everything is in respect to the, um, the unit actually, how it operates, how well it operates. Um, things can change based upon okay, how much fines you have in the catalyst. There's a lot of things in the each unit which you can which you can change. But uh, in a nutshell, I would say that okay, for for this scenario, what we have seen that if we in relocate the ring to a outer uh, ring elevation, it can change the whole hydrodynamics. So we have to be very careful in our designs also. Um, sometimes we use this tool for our um, for design evaluations to see whether what changes we are, what new changes we are bringing in, whether it makes sense or not. Another example of the uh, riser termination device, we have a uh, RSK technology, riser suppression system, what we call. Uh, so general, the standard RSK features has a, a multiple suppression chamber and a multiple stripping chamber, and it has a 90 degree turn at the top. Uh, this is a key features it has. So, but what else we can do to improve this suppression efficiency? So, I'm showing over here some potential features, okay? If we contour the riser top, just like an elbow, if you have a 90 degree turn at the riser top, or if you have an elbow turn, like a, a smooth elbow, smooth elbows are always going to give you a smooth uh, flow in the, uh, in, into the, I mean, uh, into your cyclones or in, uh, in, uh, that's, that will give you a smooth transition basically. So is it going to help? If you put the baffles in the dip leg, does it going to, does it going to make any difference? Or if you bring, I mean, make it a, because this generally this separation chamber has a multiple dip legs. So if you have a single dip leg, is it going to make any difference? So process wise or conceptual wise, it looks like yes, they are going to, but let's test it. So here I'm showing uh, four scenarios. Um, 
where we have a standard uh, riser suppression system and in the other one we put some baffles in the uh, in the dip leg then we make from a two suppression a two suppression chambers to four and then we made it add some baffles to it by moving from configuration 1 to 4 using the same uh, design principles we can make it more compact it's smaller in height and smaller in diameter so as a designer we looked into this one that oh now in my revamp situations i can fit this into a tighter uh, in a small uh, reactor also which is good for me but is it going to impact the performance here is the uh, separation efficiencies it look like for the standard one and with the baffles with additional uh, separation chambers and with a single one single dip leg so directionally it shows an improvement so this is a good i mean good thing for us okay if we have to now if we have to do the cold flow modeling we're not going to do for all uh, or the middle steps also we're going to do take the standard one and take the most uh, the the most promising one and then test that one Um, starting with the first case study, uh, here I'm showing a, a reactor um, with a riser termination device, which is a mushroom distributor submerged in the bed. During the turnaround, we found that um, there is a on the riser slots, the bird cage, which we call it, get, it was bored, that was bent outward, and it was like, okay, what can cause this thing? There are multiple scenarios. There might be wet steam over there, which vaporized and it blows the mushroom out. It might be possible something from the top. Uh, there was too much weight of the catalyst on the top of the mushroom, which bored that. So there were multiple scenarios. And what scenario was that, how about if the catalyst get filled, backfilled in the riser during the shutdown and during the, when they restarted it, it creates some sort of a compression zone or something by declogging the riser, it might have created this, uh, this bowing effect. So our mechanical group told us, oh yeah, to do, I mean, to bow this, uh, to bow this bird cage, the slots, you need at least two kgs of pressure drop across these slots. So then let's, let's model it. Let's see whether what, what is it gonna show. And in the model, in this model, uh, I'm only showing two scenarios. One is if the catalyst is backfilled in a riser, and another one is catalyst is backfilling the riser and stripper. <coughs> here we are looking at the catalyst flow pattern. Over here we are looking at the pressure profile. You will see over here in a less than a minute, uh, the pressure in the in the lower section of the riser, it goes almost to the uh, steam header pressure. And once it declogs the riser, you are getting almost like close to two kgs of pressure drop. I'm not saying that that happened in that refinery, but that that is the possibility which had happened. So we changed the procedure for how to restart the units for that specific refinery. We made some changes on that. Okay, we have a blast nozzles. We have a steam injectors at the uh, at the top of the uh, the above the feed injectors, which we ask them to re always start to clear the initial section of the riser first before they put the feed in. But it changes, bring another change in our uh, restart philosophy also. Another case study on the, not a case study, it's a, uh, a development of the Spencat distributor design. Um, here I'm showing uh, a different uh, distributors, how we, uh, we, in 80s we were having a hockey stick design, then we moved to a single arm bathtub, then a Y bathtub, then a compound angle Y bathtub, and the main objective from moving from a hockey stick to compound angle is to improve the coverage of spent catalyst in the regenerator. How we can make sure that my, if I'm dumping the catalyst over here, it, it is gonna, it's, it's gonna give a uniform temperature profile only if I'm spreading it all the way to the other end also. To achieve that, so we move from a hockey stick to a Y uh, bathtub. And over here, I'm showing the, some of the plant data of uh, almost like nine units. The initial one, which was, this is a, a bed temperature variation. Like we, uh, like there are like multiple thermocouples in the dense bed. So I'm showing over here the temperature distribution, a temperature variation in the bed. 
So with as we going from a smaller to a larger regenerators, because earlier the capacities for the FCC were not that big, but now we are designing um, like four to six times more bigger FCCs than the than what what we have designed in 80s and 90s also. So the temperature variation for the uh, earlier distributors was quite high. So, so once we move from a from a Y bathtub, it has reduced drastically. And when we move to a compound angle, it, it was basically showing there is there is no temperature variation. It's just two degrees. So temperature variation in the bed was, was has improved a lot. But what's next? What we see over here still there is some afterburn. There's still room to improve. So what should we, should we do next? Generally, we put the bathtub above the um, above the bed, above the catalyst bed. So. In this design, we we moved uh, we we submerged the bathtub. We inclined it the further down. It's still compound angle, but it's inclined at a sharper angle, and it's submerged in the in the bed at the same level where the uh, primary dip leg catalyst is discharging. So we are mixing the spent catalyst with the hot regenerated catalyst coming from these cyclones. We are mixing it where the real action is going. It has uh, in earlier design we generally have a sparger pipes to fluidize the arms of the Y. This in this design we uh, we make it self aerated. There is a tub beneath that which is open from the bottom, so it is it has a holes over there which can fluidize it, um, self fluidize it. So it doesn't need any external piping. So we make the improvements and see whether how this uh, design look like. We from a concept we went to a val CFD validation, then we implemented the design uh, in a, one of the Canadian refinery, and here are the industrial validations look like. The temperature variation in the dense in the dilute phase and in the dense phase both significantly reduced. There was an afterburn in the regenerator earlier. It basically went to zero. And now this is our standard. Uh, I won't say standard, but we are we are implementing this design in two more units now. Another on the mushroom distributor. As I was explaining earlier, uh, we use mushroom distributor in the DCC reactor also, where it has a bed above it, and in a regenerator application, uh, where we are. Uh, this is a two-stage regeneration. The first stage is over here in a partial burn. Second stage is over here. So the internal uh, riser, which we call as a lift line, it transfers the catalyst from first stage to the second stage, and it uh, mixes and distributor is mixing basically both the vapors and catalyst in the bed. Um, we have six installation in the DCC reactor. We have 56 installations in the uh, in the riser in a regenerator application, and um, in a regenerator applications we have. Uh, generally in the regenerator it gives like 5 to 25 degree afterburn. So say okay what next? Before the uh, mushroom distributor we have like a birdcage slots only over here. Now we have a mushroom distributor. We improved that to one with the, uh, I'm not showing over here, but one with the, some skirts over here. But we're constantly saying okay what, what we can improve. And here I'm showing that with the help of the CFD, uh, I'm only showing two cases, the, the current one at the most optimized case, which is a mushroom with the branch arms. Uh, what it does, it has improved the uniformity in the, in the bed, as well as it has uh, improved the, the bed cracking. So in nutshell, I would say that, okay, we are using this tool to screen ideas better to see how we can, uh, whether the changes which we are bringing in both operation wise and hardware wise that makes sense or not, or it reduces the risk of implementation. Uh, Sometimes it reduces, uh, I mean we can bypass the cold flow testing also, where the risk is less and we, we know that okay, it, it makes sense and it will work and we have some validation. Um, to summarize, yes, uh, it's a pretty effective tool. Um, we are mainly using uh, 
not mainly we are only using barracuda for gas solid modeling and uh, uh, we are bringing new technologies much faster now in the industry with that it saves a lot of time we are using this tool for both uh, design and troubleshooting thank you for questions. So we're going to have a portable mic going around so people can hear well. Uh, we're going to have the first question is going to be over here with, uh, with Mike Wardinsky. Mike, why don't you ask the question and I'll just repeat it for everyone's benefit. Uh, were you able to model the CO of NOx emissions or NO emissions uh, in the regenerator uh, case studies with CTFD? Now you mentioned afterburn. Yeah, we have done that. I think uh, we have published a paper also with that. The case for which I was showing over there earlier, uh, we have the full capability to implement, uh, to predict the uh, NOx, SOx, the flugus. Flugus composition is pretty easy to uh, predict. It's, I, I, to, to my experience, there's always uh, uh, challenging to predict the right temperatures. Flugus temperature, I mean, flugus composition is mainly a mass balance, and uh, you can all, you have to be, uh, tune the base case with the industrial data, and then see whether okay how well uh, you can implement the changes with that. But we have done that. Uh, <coughs> quantitative numbers, it might be a little off, but uh, we have done extensive study uh, okay. on that also. And uh, I forgot to mention, uh, Technip is having an alliance with. Uh, IFP, which is a research consortium uh, in France, and they have done a lot of work uh, in developing a chemistry for the SSC coke combustion also. So we use our proprietary equations to predict those. So we have implemented those equations in Baragoda and then developed the whole model for it. Elevated a air ring. And you had three elevations of air rings. You elevated one, the smaller one that was at the lowest level of the bed up to the same level as the, uh, the highest one. Yeah. Um, in your initial, I guess, base case, how did you uh, set the air rates to those, those three rings? Because I'm just, we had an FCC unit that had four levels of air rings and that lower air ring was always destroyed every, at the end of every run, I think, because we, we just never could find um, empirically a, a, a good flow rate to go to it. Uh, to keep to keep catalyst from egressing in and then chewing it out, so that was always a challenge. That's why I was wondering, you know, to, to balance the air flows between three elevations in the FCC with different catalyst heads above each air ring, how you set that initial um, base case on that. The initial the uh, the initial base case the concept was and uh, I don't uh, I haven't shown the whole three D view of it. Uh, but it has a stand, region catalyst standby below the, the bottom head. So the idea was to fluidize the lowest head also. And to, to achieve that, the only way possible is to have a three at, the, at a different elevation, to put the distributor at three different elevations. So uh, the, flow, the flow deviation in, in those ones were based upon strictly on the area coverage and the volume of coke we are burning. But in, in the industry, for that case, what we found that when we move the air to an inner ring, it was giving us much better uh, performance in terms of the uh, temperature profile as well as cat losses. The loading to the cyclones was much uniform if we move from um, outer to inner ring. If you bias the flow from outer to inner ring. And it was also one of the reasons that uh, this rings, uh, the distributor was pretty big. And uh, the flow from the inner ring, it was joining the outer ring because it has to go through the path of least resistance. So we cannot change the size of the ring at that time. So we said, okay, let's, if we can move, take the existing ring and move it up. Because that's why I, want to, I was mentioning earlier, for that case, it was implemented. But now you can still do the staggered ring, but you have to uh, carefully design the ring size or spacing between the distributors. So to make sure that the gas from one distributor won't 
joined with the other one. Because gas always try to, we not gas, we always try to do the least amount of work. So it was doing the same thing. So okay, let's, this is a better way to follow. Let's follow in that direction. Uh, hi, Raj. Thanks for your presentation. Um, so just to understand the mythology of, of how you're working. So when you're faced with a, a design problem or something like that, then you, you try to collect as much plant data as you can. And then you tune your model to that plant data in order to predict different alterations in the design. Either or plant data or core flow test, or you need to you need to have some some validation of what you're doing. As I was mentioning earlier, it's like a garbage in, garbage out. You have to be very careful. Your base case represents the best possible scenario. You cannot match to the uh, I mean industrial uh, commercial data exactly match to the commercial data or to the cold flow, but it should be close enough. You should, you should be confident enough to say that okay, this represents my uh, my scenario. Otherwise, if you start with the wrong uh, conclusion, I mean uh, the, you might not find the right sol right solution at that time. Yeah, but still, I guess you have a, sort of a challenge in, in taking in cold flow data and then seeing, okay, my predictions are actually not uh, fitting with the experimental data. So I just tune my model and then I use that for a prediction of a full scale vessel. Yes, then I you guess use that's that a challenge. For, the case. Yeah, for okay. example, for the, if you have a degenerator uh, operating data, you know what the densities in the bed look like, what, where the levels are, how the temperature, uh, the temperature profiles look like, what's the, uh, in, I mean, your losses looks like. So you can back calculate certain things and try to match those ones. Thanks. Uh, hi, and the gas solid systems, uh, you know, drag has always been a challenge, right? There are a number of laws out there that describe that. And the other day in the presentation from PSRI, also we have seen that there is a lot of counterintuitive behavior coming up from uh, drag models. What, what has been your experience uh, with the drag uh, over the years? It's a difficult, <laughs> co difficult question. Uh, but uh, as, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, we tried to we try to uh, make you best use of what we have right now. So that's one of the reasons I'm saying that we look at the qualitative change, not in absolute numbers. We tune the model based, we change the uh, drag, a little bit drag also to see, to replicate our uh, base model also. So that's a key. Um, but again, we don't rely completely on our quantitative numbers. Uh, we looked at the delta shift. Uh, drag improvements in the drag is is going to take another ten years before we resolve that issue. This is ongoing for last ten to twenty years now, and uh, it's this is a tough problem to handle. Uh, it's not the drag. I, to my understanding, is that we need to implement the whole whole physics in that instead of using a simplified formulas for the drag, which is only applicable for certain scenarios. And we are not uh, modeling the certain scenarios. As Casey was uh, showing the whole loop of the, uh, of the circulating fluid as bed, one drag cannot, one drag correlation cannot justify the model of the whole loop. Your drag is different in the, in the riser. Your drag is different in the, um, in the cyclones. Your drag is different in the standpipes. You cannot use the same one. Unless Baragora comes with a with another uh, model where we can specify different drags and different sections of the of your uh, domain, then it is possible. But other you cannot use just one uh, correlation for to predict the flow pattern in the whole uh, in of your whole domain. So generally, what we do is that uh, we cut our domain in a way that we know that okay, in this region, the flow dynamics is not going to be impacted by the drag. do some of the things uh, with what's possible today and what could be coming in the future. So let's talk about that as the conference goes on. Raj, I, I love how you uh, solve practical problems with what's available today. So uh, let's thank our speaker one more time.